So, uh, welcome everyone to this panel session. I'm uh, Kostas Papadopoulos uh, from Master University and I'll be chairing this uh, panel. So um, we write in the title that it takes a village uh, to build an infrastructure for 3D scholarly editions. And I'm here today with uh, many of my fellow villagers uh, with whom we have been developing uh, pure 3D, namely Susan Schreibman and uh, Kelly Gillikinswery from Master University, uh, Jamie Cope uh, from uh, the Smithsonian, John Blandell also from the Smithsonian, but he couldn't be here uh, together, and Jan Ogawa and Kyonori Nagasaki from the University of Tokyo. Um, so, um, and, and you will get to meet all of them in a while. So this panel explores uh, the various aspects of what is involved, not only in conceiving uh, and building the infrastructure, but in creating the 3D editions and developing uh, a viewing and editing apparatus that allows narratives or stories to be created around them. And it will also explore issues around training uh, also a key to the development of the infrastructure, particularly given that uh, conceptually, methodologically, and technically, uh, the requirements for creating 3D scholarly editions are quite different from what we have been training for uh, over the past uh, 20 plus years for more traditional text-based editions. So without uh, hesitation, I will ask uh, Susan to come for the first presentation on what is a 3D scholarly edition. So, um, I start some of my talks um, it, uh, uh, with this, and it really started when a textual scholar, me, met an archaeologist, which is Custis, and I just have to say, it was really easy finding good archaeologist pictures. I couldn't find, and we spent a long time yesterday looking for a female textual editor, not that you, he, you, he looks like a textual editor, but he, but he did come up as one. So. Anybody who makes pictures and puts them on the web, I think this is something that's really missing. Um, um, so basically it starts when I meet Costas in a previous institution and he was telling me all the problems with uh, uh, 3D, putting 3D on the web, contextualizing it, et cetera, et cetera. And I said, well, you know, we've been doing this for a long time in the textual space. And the idea of uh, use the additions using whatever technologies are available, the scroll, the book, the web, to find new ways to present, to augment, to analyze, written or print text. I have these new eyes, and so I'm always trying to figure out where I need to be in relation to things. So I think for new digital scholarly editions, really I think of them more now as knowledge sites for dissemination, for research, which are informed by the, inform uh, the affordances of the medium and the technologies we have. And over the course of my career, they have changed enormously what we can do with text on the web. When I started working with Costas, uh, we realized, or I certainly realized, that these webs, I'll call them of intertextuality, they, they weren't available for people working with 3D. Um, if you work with 3D, you know that people build them, they use them for analysis, they put them in articles, not them in articles, they put pictures of them in articles, maybe they make a video and put it on YouTube. Um, but this is because of the constraints around 3D and the, the changing, even I have a project, which I actually am not talking about today, I think, Mount Street Bridge, that's kind of old, from 2013, and every time we put it on the web and it launches, something changes in the browser, or the technology, and it, it doesn't work anymore. Um, there's no standardized ways of displaying um, knowledge structures around 3D, no architecture like we have, say, with TI, with XML, for metadata, paradata, et cetera. So we decided to combine our expertise and explore what does it mean to apply the principles of digital scholarly, of scholarly editions digital sc to 3D models. And the roles don't work perfectly for editors of print and editors of the, who do edit 3D editions, but we'll, we'll try. They're less clear cut. So here's, I'm an Irish study scholar first, 
an edition, very famous edition of James Joyce's Ulysses, it is clear Joyce is the author. And it's clear that Hans Walter Gabler is the editor, and it's published this edition by Gabler in Random House, 1984. We know that. As with the Ulysses example, in many ways, what people are doing with 3D is to stabilize the text. Here you have to uh, work with me a little bit and imagine the 3D model as the text. Um, so to correct any errors um, that creep into what we do with scholarly editions, we correct errors that creep into the publishing process. Sometimes we make more in the way we interpret. And we have to provide a rationale for the edits that we make. So if we think of the additions of models, if we think of the model of the text, if you can, if this is weird and but suspend disbelief, who's the author? Um, if the model is reproduction, for example, of a building, this is, this is Mount Street, who's the author? Is it the architect? Is it the builder? Is it the modeler who creates the surrogate? So I think in this case that analogy maybe doesn't work so well. But the parallels are not perfect, but I think we have a case for thinking of the author of the model as, as the modeler in the case of reproduction, reconstructions, in which the modeler is recreating something, an ancient building, reconstructing an artifact out of fragments. I, and, and even though it's not a perfect, I still, we th still think of the 3D model as a text with a new set of motivations for creating an addition around it. In the case of 3D scholarly editions, we are um, maybe not trying to restore what we call authorial intention, however one describes that, what the author meant if they could have um, republished the book in the perfect way that they wanted. Like, but maybe more like what we do in historical editing, say a diplomatic edition, trying to represent the object or the world being modeled. So in the case of extent objects like this, we're trying to create as faithful a representation as we can using a method such as photogrammetry. So the 3D object, of course, is a representation in itself. It's a domain-specific model which simplifies the complexity of the environment being represented. Who the author is, who the editor is, maybe is the editor then the person who maybe creates the model and puts all these annotations on there. Even if they're different people, they might be. Someone might actually do the 3D modeling and someone else with the skills and expertise. Um, so probably a, another way to think about this, the modeler is another kind of editor, maybe, in the text reconstruction as opposed to the author. Given the possibilities now in all kinds of scholarly editions, we have the possibility of more dynamic annotation. So linked data, computer vision, the role of the editor could even be assumed by non-human actors. When you model a world that no longer exists in some fragmentary form, the reconstructions are much more speculative. They can be used as heuristic tools from which to build knowledge, spatial and temporal relationships, using sound maybe or, or light. And these reconstructions can force, demonstrate, um, for people to look at evidence anew, uh, to look at evidence that maybe we traditionally overlook, um, and it can be built into the model and analyzed within it. So in this way, I think these 3D scholar editions are not unlike digital scholarly editions in th terms of thinking of them as lay assemblages or um, machines of knowledge uh, as uh, written about by Deleuze and Guattari. They can be, they are objects that can be read and understood through and by their means of production and reception to revisit long elevated uh, textual practices such as annotation, apparatus, commentary, etc. So what are these additions? What are these sites of knowledge? What exactly is an annotation? In a digital edition, we use, in addition to text, we can use audio, visual, and you'll see some of this later. Uh, we can change camera angles to actually be an annotation. Um, we can layer with other objects like a map here. It, contain, it could contain linked data. Um, as I said before, we are being trained how to understand trains of scholarship, but how do we understand trains of scholarship when we have non, 
uh, human actors, as in this linked open data example? Um, should reconstructions be considered like annotation? Um, what the floor might have been in, in a Roma villa, for example. Um, they can also contain interactive content. A medieval church could be modeled to its original structure so a musicologist can reconstruct its sonic space. And annotations can be triggered by users um, moving through space. So our colleagues in the Netherlands who are part of the Virtual Interiors Project have written about 3D editions as on this slide and they talk about it in three steps which is a quite nice um, way to think about it to use a 3D in the reconstruction, the construction to generate insights followed by discovery where you bring uh, the public, other academics in to maybe create additional knowledge and then um, oh, sharing of knowledge and then uh, taking that knowledge, bringing it back, and then uh, a, a site of discovery. And so as Custis said, the following papers are going to explore more fully what came out of this original discussion. So we will uh, do questions at the, at the end, so you have the chance to ask the, the whole panel. So the infrastructure we're talking about is Pure 3D, which started in January 2021 and goes uh, to September or December 2024. Uh, it has been funded by the, a Dutch funding instrument uh, called Platform Digital Infrastructure for Social Science and Humanities. Um, and the idea behind that was to support existing infrastructure developments in, in the Netherlands. And Pure 3D is one of uh, the infrastructures that uh, were funded Funded, and it has three aims. Uh, first, to develop the infrastructure for authoring and viewing 3D scholarly editions. To provide the system and tools for depositing 3D scholarly editions, including the files associated with the, with the editions under the FAIR principles. And ultimately, providing a framework, conceptual and methodological, for recognizing and rewarding interactive 3D scholarship. And we'll say a few more things about that later. So the main project teams come from uh, Master University with a humanities cluster at the National Academy hosting and developing house, the infrastructure, and the data uh, archiving and network services uh, in the Netherlands uh, is responsible for metadata and for developing guidelines for FAIR. Uh, data. Uh, we also have a range of uh, heritage institutions that contribute uh, pilot projects for the development of the infrastructure and these range from digitized objects to virtual worlds and come also from different fields, uh, from history, from archaeology, architecture, history of art and so forth and they all have different use cases in mind. So for example uh, some of them are more public oriented, others are um, more interested in catering for scholarly audiences. And here uh, I'm just showing you some uh, preliminary editions that have been uh, developed by the uh, pilot project partners uh, from the 4D Research Lab where here they played with the idea of paradata and included archival sources in the uh, 3D model to explain the decision making process. Uh, Cultural Heritage Agency in Leiden where they developed uh, rep, uh, an edition for Rembrandt's birthplace, uh, Susan's, the Battle of uh, Mount Street Bridge, uh, Van Bommel Van Damme, uh, a small cultural heritage institution uh, of uh, modern art um, in, uh, in Venlo, uh, Maastricht uh, based on a, on a model of the city from 1748 and then uh, from uh, the Mining Museum of uh, the Netherlands uh, they have also digitized and are producing editions of a collection of mining lamps. So, as Susan mentioned earlier, we have taken the, the inspiration from the field of digital scholarly editions as a way to establish and contextualize texts. So, the goal of uh, Pure3D is to create a similar environment for 3D scholarship, an information space to convey the history of an object or space or to speculate uh, about the object, perhaps through a reconstruction. And through this process, readers are taken on a journey, not necessarily to a specific endpoint or a single thesis, uh, uh, but here scholarship and the 3D models themselves are presented within a single 
spatial and temporal environment that is immersive, is multivariant and multimodal. So to achieve this, the 3D models essentially become the text of conventional publication paradigms. And this is done by means of contextualization with multimodal annotation, uh, the documentation of uh, metadata, of paradata as well, so the documentation of the creation process, providing users with uh, modeling and interpretative choices, as well as scholarly arguments. Therefore, creating a multimodal uh, resource that is uh, uh, not easy to replicate in print form. So when we started this project, our premise was not to reinvent the wheel. So in the beginning of the process, we conducted an environment scan on 3D web infrastructures and a survey on user requirements. Uh, we run lots of uh, focus groups, design thinking sessions. The results of those, if you're interested, are published as reports on, report on the Pure 3D website, essentially aiming at seeing what others have done and how Pure 3D can build on previous work. So in Environment Scan, for example, we compare 3D viewers based on their features uh, and use the best candidates to experiment with small-scale uh, small pilot projects. Um, because our project essentially has three components. One is the viewing of 3D objects, the editing of the 3D objects, and then the archiving of the uh, 3D objects. So essentially, uh, to use the, the terms of the Open Archival Information System standards uh, for archiving, we have the submission information packets, the archiving information packets, and the dissemination information packets. So a 3D scholarly edition is not about the 3D model online. It has to be written and edited so that the 3D model is contextualized within a scholarly narrative. So we start with a workspace that will allow the authors of 3D editions to upload a 3D model and related materials, view the model, uh, in a 3D viewer. Uh, the way we're building the infrastructure, now we are using a Smithsonian's uh, uh, toolkit, Smithsonian Voyager's toolkit, but the idea is that other viewers can potentially be integrated into the system. Uh, so view the model in a 3D viewer of their choice and uh, develop annotations, textual, multimodal, camera views, as Susan uh, was saying. And when they save the work, the, the workspace captures the annotations that have been made in the viewer and stores them alongside the 3D model. Uh, and uh, Jamie will talk uh, more about uh, Voyager, but essentially we're using Voyager Story and Voyager uh, uh, Explorer. Explorer is the front end uh, 3D web viewing interface and then Story is the authoring interface for adding annotation and multimedia content. So, a 3D edition is eventually represented as a data set containing a 3D model, related materials, annotations, and metadata. And then in the ultimate stage, the dissemination, users must be able to search and browse the archived editions and their content and read those editions. And here you just see uh, the, the workflow. So this is an impression of what the uh, infrastructure might look like. The design is not final, but users will be provided with functionalities to explore the already developed uh, project. So what you see here as Explore 3D projects. Uh, each project will have its uh, own dedicated page, which could also be personalized, uh, adding metadata, context, information about the funders, the project team, and so forth. But the idea is that each project could also have multiple editions. So in the case of um, the Battle of Mountstreet Bridge that uh, Susan is doing, uh, the, there are multiple buildings that are uh, developed as individual editions. So the project is the, the Battle of Mountstreet Bridge, but then there are multiple editions for each of the buildings. Um, and also, each of the editions also have uh, a dedicated page uh, with information about those editions. So when users want to consult published uh, digital scholarly editions, the repository must allow them to search and browse uh, those editions by their metadata, the textual content of the enrichments, uh, content of annotations, and so forth, and possibly by characteristics of the models themselves, potentially. Uh, we're not yet there, I think, in development, but potentially geolocation, quality, number of objects, kind of objects, and so forth. But of course, there are many challenges uh, that need to be solved, and I don't have uh, the, the time to get into all of those, but I just want to mention a few. So the fact that uh, 3D web viewers play a crucial role in editing 3D scholarly editions, for example, by adding annotations, means that research data become entangled with um, the current technology of 3D viewers. And of course, for digital preservation, that's a no-go. But there is no alternative 
although what we're trying to achieve in Pure 3D is to at least make the annotations of the 3D uh, editions more independent, so to, to be able to be accessed uh, separately and also extracted. But what happens uh, if in a few years the web viewing technology does not work anymore? Uh, how would uh, we be able to reenact uh, the viewing experience? Uh, is emulation an option? Probably not. We'll not have the resources of gaming companies. Um, so, shall we preserve the intended interaction and, views, and, and viewing experience using images and videos and so forth? So I think these are all open to discussion. And when we're talking about 3D, we're also thinking of immersion. So the scholarly environments that exist for scholarly 3D are not I immersive, uh, similarly to a gaming environment at least, but how do we bridge that gap? Or do we want to bridge that gap? Uh, one way to read the scholarly edition is by being in immersed uh, to it through a 3D viewer, but what happens if a 3D viewer stops functioning? Uh, if there's nothing else to a digital scholarly edition, then uh, they're very much in danger of getting obsolete in just a few years, as it has happened many, many times already. Also think that annotations may grow. Uh, would it always be convenient to get to the annotations and read the annotations through the viewer? Does all the text need to be read in proximity to the viewing experience? So I think these are all uh, open uh, questions. And of course, you know, there, there are uh, people who also, researchers who engage in systematic analysis of data, and for that reason they may want to access annotated material in other ways uh, outside the viewer. Um, and how much w might we deal with all the material we have collected uh, to build a 3D scholarly edition? Uh, I'm an archaeologist, uh, we look at field notes, uh, lots, lots of material we'll, we collect, and then some of this find its place in a 3D scholarly edition. But then what do we do with those mostly digital files? Actually, what is the aim uh, of this? Is it the reconstruction of the thought process? Uh, and is this even possible? Is it for preservation? Is it for use? So what do we uh, preserve in this process? Um, and of course, we are now uh, have started dealing also with metadata with our colleagues at uh, DANS. Uh, uh, and we have started mapping uh, from Dublin Core to Dataverse uh, metadata elements to our projects to see um, uh, you know, how we can uh, uh, deal with that. Um, but even for an infrastructure such as uh, Pure3D that has a limited scope, essentially to present and preserve 3D objects together with the rich scholarly narratives, there are many moving pieces and questions that our field has not really managed to um, uh, resolve or at least achieve consensus uh, even after several um, decades essentially of discussions, expert groups, pilots, and projects. Uh, how do we deal with fair data? How do we deal with versioning? Uh, how do we deal with changes in technologies and so forth? So these are all uh, open uh, questions. And I would like to close with a challenge that uh, has always been close to, uh, to my heart and has to do with recognizing and rewarding this kind of scholarship. Um, because despite the immense amount of scholarly work that the 3D visualization requires, 3D is not really recognized as an autonomous form of, of scholarship. And it always exists in this fragmented information space where you have the 3D artifacts included in online publications as mostly illustrative uh, figures, uh, therefore uh, not making visible the scholarship that has gone into their creation, uh, decisions, sources, variables, and essentially we're talking about a, a black boxing uh, process. And of course think for a moment when such outputs need to be evaluated uh, to get an academic position or to get tenure or to get promotion. Motion. And in the past few years, there have been a few attempts to deal with this fragmentation. A few journals uh, support the embedding of 3D models in online publications. A few publishing houses also have started supporting digital monographs. And I think we're at a good moment to change this now that there are several institutions and initiatives which have started seriously discussing the reform of research assessment. And uh, we're going to do that with uh, a new um, uh, project that we just uh, received to explore open publishing and peer review of 3D scholarship. Essentially, uh, what we're trying, we will try to do is to see how uh, we can turn pure 3D into a publication infrastructure with a publication and peer review workflow uh, for 3D scholarly editions, uh, also potentially in collaboration with academic publishers. 
And I will close uh, with this slide. So we are at the stage where uh, the prototype of the infrastructure is almost uh, ready. So we want to open it up to those who have 3D models uh, to come and develop uh, 3D scholarly editions using our infrastructure. And through this, we also want to test workflows for publication, for peer review. Uh, so for those of you who work with 3D or you know colleagues who work with 3D, please uh, spread uh, the word. And Jamie uh, Cope and Kelly Sueri will also tell you more about the authoring and viewing interface uh, that uh, you will be using for uh, to develop the editions, as well as for the training that we have provided already to cultural heritage institutions and the kind of training we will provide to this new round of projects. So I will now uh, hand over to Jamie Cope from the Smithsonian to talk about the integration of the Voyager Toolkit into Pure 3D. Thank you. Thank you, Costas. Um, so I'm Jamie Cope, and I am the uh, lead software developer for the 3D team at the Smithsonian's Digitization Program Office. And what we do is we 3D digitize Smithsonian collections objects. Over the years, we've scanned thousands of things, um, everything from insects to airplanes. And once we have that 3D data, we create these high resolution digital surrogates. And then we move on to the second part of our mission, which is to um, take this data and these assets and make them available to the public uh, whenever possible. And one of the ways that we do that is through Voyager. Our uh, web tool suite for 3D authoring and display of um, interactive experiences. So what is Voyager? Um, it's an open source software. It's available right now on GitHub for anyone to try out. Um, it's browser based, so it can be used on uh, any device that supports a web browser. So your home computer, your mobile device, um, or even something like a touch screen in a gallery. Uh, it has integrated augmented reality support and it also supports a couple of different types of learning um, as illustrated in these uh, quick animations on the right. Um, we have directed learning, which comes in the form of tours. So essentially guiding your user um, through a linear narrative around that object. And then we also have exploratory learning, which is you know, a more self-directed approach where the user is going at their own pace, um, exploring the model and the information. Um, a little bit of a technical overview. Um, Voyager is made up of web components, so essentially uh, discrete chunks of functionality that can be dropped into a web page. Um, it has a backend component called Voyager Story, and that's where curators or other subject matter experts will craft these narratives around their 3D models. And then we have our front end component called Voyager Explorer, which is where we'll take those experiences and present them to the public. Um, this is an in-house set of tools that we've created and maintain. Um, in the past, we did try um, several different uh, commercial solutions, and the lesson we learned there was that we really needed more control over the direction of the project to ensure um, longevity. Um, but in the same vein, we do um, understand and acknowledge that you know, any digital tools or projects will have a shelf life. Um, and as uh, Costas mentioned in his presentation, we do have that issue of data being entangled with um, the 3D technologies. So what we've done um, to address that is we've separated the data that represents the 3D model from the data that represents the experience. So then as um, technologies continue to, to grow and improve, our 3D models will be able to grow and change along with them. Um, and we won't lose that experience data. That experience data will be able to be ported to um, whatever platform comes next, or potentially even you know, the ability to support multiple platforms at the same time. Um, and that experience data is made up of tours, articles, and annotations. Um, and those are all crafted in Voyager Story with what you see is what you get editors, which basically just means that as a creator, you can feel confident that what you've um, created, what you see on screen, is exactly what your end user will see when they experience it. So why do we have Voyager, and what does it do for us? Well, in the cultural, cultural heritage arena, um, we would never just take an object out of storage and just drop it on a table in a gallery. So we would take care to light it, you know, pose it, add props, and then add additional educational content all designed to provide context to the object and to help tell a story. So with Voyager, our goal is to do that same thing, but with our digital assets. So we have full control over lighting the object, um, posing it, 
adding props, which in this example are annotations that describe specific points of interest on the surface of the model. Um, we have our content, which comes in the form of articles, which includes long form text, images, embedded video, pretty much any type of multimedia that you would see on a web page. And then we have a discrete audio option, which allows your end users to actually hear someone uh, tell them a story as well. So the Pure 3D project decided to uh, integrate Voyager into their system as one of their modes of visualizing their 3D data. Um, and this collaboration has been um, hugely beneficial to us um, in a number of different ways. Um, one of the big ones being the access that we've gotten to their um, user groups. So the Pure 3D users have different perspectives, they have different goals with using this system, and they even sometimes have different paths that they take through the software. Um, and all of these things sort of have come together to help us um, improve the product uh, by not just, you know, adding features to support some of these other use cases, but also by exposing um, bugs and other issues that we were able to address. Um, we get sometimes, you know, a little um, siloed in our bubble, so having this, these different perspectives to break us out of that um, has been really great. Um, and specifically, we found that a number of the Pure 3D users were focused on 3D environments, whereas at the Smithsonian, we really tend to focus on 3D objects. So one or more things, you know, sitting out there in front of you that you're navigating around and exploring, whereas with environments, it's a pretty different experience because you're essentially inside of your object and you're exploring it in a first-person way, um, moving through the information. So we needed to think about how we could better support that um, use case. Uh, and then, of course, the, the Pure 3D team needed to actually integrate our code base into their backend infrastructure. So that was another opportunity to take a process, this time the integration, um, and refine it. So there were some bumps along the way um, that we were able to improve. So hopefully down the road, um, any other collaborators that also would like to integrate will have a, an easier time of it. Um, and along the way, they were also nice enough to contribute uh, several uh, code fixes as well that we could fold back into our code base. Um, and we spend a lot of time working on these tools and refining them, so it was really nice to have the Pure 3D team focus on um, training and documentation. So th those new perspectives from their users not only help to improve the system and the tools, but they also help to improve the uh, process that we use to bring users into that, that tool. Um, and I also just wanted to mention here that we've been um, super thankful for how engaged um, this team has been as a partner, and um, they've done a, a number of different um, testing and training sessions and provided us with feedback. Um, and, you know, it wasn't just like, oh, you know, this could be improved or we see a deficiency here, but it pretty much always comes along with um, concrete ideas on how we could um, improve that certain aspect, which is, you know, super helpful in a, a partnership like this. Um, and then just generally, you know, increased exposure. Um, the more eyes we can get on our tools, um, the better they'll be in the end. Uh, and a few lessons learned. So again, you know, I don't think I can, I can say this enough times, but the, the new and different perspectives that we got from the Pure 3D user group was just um, super helpful in improving our tools in, you know, all the ways that I previously mentioned. Um, one of the specific things we learned is that there was a relatively high barrier to entry to our front end tool. Um, and so that really prompted us to spend some time thinking about how we can improve that and to develop some things like tutorials and integrated um, help menus to try to make that process smoother. Um, and also, you know, we think that we've created some pretty good tools for, for content generation. But even with the best tools, if our um, creators don't know how to effectively use them, we can still end up with suboptimal results. So for example, we found that um, a number of our experts are coming to the table with a more um, traditional linear storytelling knowledge, which is great, we, we do support that, but that they need a little bit more guidance um, in how to do things like effectively use a 3D space or create a more interactive exploratory narrative. And once again, just wanted to mention that um, all the tools that I've talked about are open source um, and available on GitHub. So here's the, the link, but you can also just search um, Smithsonian Voyager. Um, if you're interested, please do um, jump in on GitHub or just reach out um, via email. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.
Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Kelly gilkin and I will take over the next phase of this panel presentation, and that is training the community theoretical and methodological considerations. Uh, so since the beginning of the Pure 3D project, it has been pretty clear that training the concept of a 3D scholarly edition using dedicated 3D annotating tools like Voyager Toolkit um, is a really integral part of designing and developing this 3D infrastructure. Our approach to training editors has been rooted in the idea that a 3D edition should fundamentally incorporate annotation and apparatus in ways that directly interact with the 3D model. And in order to achieve this, our training activities have aimed towards two main objectives. The first is to conceptualize 3D scholarly editions as a novel form of scholarly communication and to teach com competency in developing a 3D scholarly edition within Voyager Story specifically. And over the course of our iterative training process, uh, we have come to realize the core theoretical grounding of training others to develop their own 3D scholarly edition lies within aspects of intermedial theory. For one, it is important that editors realize that the 3D model as one type of medium it, uh, is actually referring to another type of medium. Uh, Schroeder labels this process as transformational intermediality, whereby the original medium's individual qualities, meanings, and modes of expressions are defamiliarized in ways that could contribute to new aesthetics, narratives, or communication possibilities. Therefore, the editor must recognize that they are working not with the original physical object, but with a 3D digitally rendered version of it. Um, and this ultimately requires a different set of approaches and perspectives when curating content around that 3D model. Secondly, the idea of a 3D model as a center of a medial constellation is also an important theoretical consideration. Uh, Rajewski describes a media constellation as a project, uh, as a product in which each media element contributes to uh, the constitution and signification of the entire product, product in their own specific way. Uh, therefore, 3D scholarly editors should be critical in making decisions about the content and the media types that they are selecting as annotation for that 3D representation. And finally, the idea of object biographies has re relevance to editing 3D scholarly editions. Uh, 3D uh, object biographies is taken from the field of material cultural studies, and they are sources of historical knowledge about the object's existence. And this ranges from the birth of the object to its life and then eventually its death. Um, by understanding this, editors can view the edition development as an opportunity to discuss larger issues or phenomenon, uh, such as ethnographic collections from a context of colonialism and museum repatriation, or in the case of our, one of our partners, the roles that mining lamp um, technology plays in the health and safety of miners. So as part of the Pure 3D project activities, we have conducted a series of training modules for various stakeholder groups. These groups include bachelor student, public sector heritage professionals, and academics from a wide range of research interests. And it's important to note that with some groups, we had an entire semester or even a year to train and develop the edition together with them. But with others, it was only a week or two. And for our latest training session, we actually only had a day, and that was in the context of a conference workshop. And uh, the training materials and procedure has been developed through an iterative and collaborative design cycle. And with each session, more or less, we follow this six-step process. Um, but we have to make adaptions to each session in order to accommodate for the varying timeframes that we have together with the editors. And the first step is to make a quick first to <laughs> introduce the Pure 3D project and its goals for developing the infrastructure for 3D scholarship. Uh, this is also the time to introduce the concept of a 3D scholarly edition as the end product that the editors will be making. And finally, we quickly provide an overview to the tool that they're about to engage with, which is the Smithsonian Voyager Toolkit. And then after introductions, we jump right into training of how to use Voyager through a tutorial of an abbreviated version of our 25 Northumberland Road edition. This tutorial walks them through step-by-step -step instructions on basic creation of annotation, articles, and tours within Voyager. Um, the tutorial also includes additional instruction that aims to introduce like, less intuitive capabilities within Voyager, as well as how to potentially correct like uh, user errors that might come up. Um, and this like tutorial usually takes about one and a half to two hours for participants to complete, depending on how, how savvy they are with technology. Um, each time we conduct the training session, we ask participants to point out mistakes or confusing syntax in the instruction. And this has been really useful for us to, to improve the understandability of the tutorial itself. And we also make changes to the tutorial as the software itself is updated. So 
the Voyager team, um, they do updates every month, and sometimes there are major changes that we'd like to incorporate into the tutorial. Uh, so once the participants have completed most or all of this like basic tutorial, we have them get started on thinking of their own 3D edition. Uh, we use either online brainstorming tools such as Google Jamboard or Miraboard, or we propose like the analog pen and paper with sticky notes. Uh, the editors uh, can abstract out their 3D representation via a 30 minute brainstorming exercise. Then we ask the editors to consider all the data they have about their objects or the place that is represented in 3D. Uh, then we ask if that information can be attached or associated to specific locations on the model or to certain camera views. Again, trying to focus in back on that materiality and spatiality of 3D. Uh, this is step number four is conceptualization. Uh, this is where the largest amount of time is actually spent in developing the 3D edition. It involves planning, organizing, writing, and sometimes even extra research. Uh, and for the most part, we as instructors try to take a step back to allow the editors to organize and plan as they choose for their own comfort level. However, before they get started, we suggest a method that we found useful for conceptualizing the edition. Um, this is that we recommend using a PowerPoint present, uh, the PowerPoint medium to abstract out like the tour in Voyager. So this means that each page of the PowerPoint can be viewed as a step of the tour with some page can some pages containing an article with the title, the text, and any multimedia, and bibliographic references that provide additional con contextualization and scholarly substantiation. We also suggest that they keep in mind uh, what is occurring within the 3D space as the tour is progressing, such as which annotations become enabled at which step, uh, or what is the camera view on the 3D representation during that tour. Uh, once the editors have gathered and developed their content, they return to Voyager to implement their edition within the system. And hopefully at this stage, the editors um, remember <laughs> enough how to interact with Voyager so that they can easily create the annotations, articles, and tours, or do other things that they'd like without extra help from us, but sometimes uh, they forget or need a bit of help from us. Um, this is also a moment when the creative aspect of, cre of developing edition can take over for them. Um, this happens through trial and error, experimentation. Um, the editor discovers novel ways of linking 3D space to the annotations embedded in and orbiting the model. This is also uh, an opportunity to present problem solving and troubleshooting where conceptual ideas about how to represent the narrative require some tweaking. So somebody might have an idea that they think is gonna work really well, but then in actuality it, it doesn't. Um, so again, the, the amount of support from our team at this stage really depends on the time frame we have together. Uh, if it's just a day, we really only have a day to sort of think about this with them. If it's a semester or a year, we can like elongate this process infinitely. Um, but yeah, sometimes uh, in, in two cases, we've come back together with them to, to help with the implementation, so we did like a a hackathon, a Voyager hackathon, which was just like getting everybody in a room and saying, you're not leaving until your edition is complete. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and then, yeah, for the more compressed version, so like just for a day or a week, we try to ask them to do like a very quick edition, um, which is by creating at least three annotations, two articles, and then try to put them together into a condensed tour so that, nope, sorry. Yeah, I can't, okay. <laughs> um, and then finally, revision is the final stage. Uh, once the editor has completed the Voyage edition to their satisfaction, we will take a look at it and provide some feed feedback and comments. Uh, this might include ideas on where to provide some clarity to the narrative or make suggestions of Voy Voyager features that they hadn't considered or they didn't know about um, that could better suit their objective with telling that narrative. And based on these training sessions, we found that learning how to use Voyager software is really easy to teach. Like, it's a very intuitive uh, framework, but even for those who have a background in the more traditional text-based editing, what is challenging is the change in mindset to how to edit it, an edition in which the text, uh, in which the textual center is actually a 3D model, as Susan was explaining in her presentation. Um, to do so necessitates an annotative focus on place-based location, originating, originating from physicality of that model. Um, some other challenges we have identified include the fact that Voyager does not accommodate very well an edition-like presentation, 
Um, this is because of its more storytelling oriented focus, which is designed for public rather than scholarly audiences. Uh, but we're working on ways to work around that. Um, oh, sorry. Um, another realization that we kind of came, came to is that there's really no ready-made formula that we can teach others to follow when developing their edition. This is because every object is unique um, and there are really many infinite ways to approach the conceptualization of, ed of edition around that object. Uh, we've also seen the temptation for editors to start immediately with annotating their 3D representation right at the outset of designing the narrative. Um, in this scenario, we observe that there is too much of a focus on the model um, and the editors fail to develop interesting content that contextualizes how that model links um, to wider themes such as colonialism or artistic movements, um, et cetera. In this case, the editor seems to hit a wall in terms of what more they can say about the object. Um, on the other hand, we have also seen editors go in the opposite direction where they focus too much on the content development and, concept and conceptualization in 2D. And when this happens, it leads to a neglect of that 3D model and how the annotative content can and should be connected back into the 3D space. Uh, we've seen that in this scenario, the 3D model becomes merely an accessory, uh, moving about in the background while slide after slide of text is presented. So based on this iterative training process and collaborations with participants and the Voyager development team, we are understanding which aspects of designing 3D scholarly editions should be emphasized during this training process. For one, it's uh, clear that brainstorming, the brainstorming stage is an integral first part of developing the edition. Um, we've learned that we can emphasize the importance of centralizing the 3D model at this earlier stage by having them identify which physical characteristics of that model can be used to further a narrative. Um, another aspect that we can reinforce in training is clear instructions on the potentials and limitations of the 3D web viewer being used, so in this case Voyager. And we can kind of help facilitate this uh, knowledge by enriching our tutorial and providing robust documentation on how to manifest certain interaction desires we can showcase that there is a lot more that can be uh, accomplished in the 3D environment that goes beyond basic navigation and zooming around that model. Uh, to uh, also to avoid the disconnect between 3D and annotation, we should encourage that the editors go back and forth between the 3D space and the 2D conceptualization of that content. We've discovered that the creative process in working with 3D narratives requires this iterative experimentation and problem solving that could and should occur for each person. Finally, we encourage that the editors get feedback not only from our team, but also from their peers and even potentially their own target audiences. So um, I'll wrap this up with future plans. Our future plans for training in the next year include fine tuning these training materials and workshops, specifically in, in anticipation of the new set of purity editors that Koss has mentioned. We have the call for new 3D projects. Um, we're also in the process of conglomerating knowledge about Voyager into the already existing Smithsonian GitHub documentation page. Um, the idea behind this is to provide all users of Voyager, like so not just pure 3D ones, with a single source of knowledge that can be maintained and updated. And in the winter teaching term, we will incorporate these 3D editing concepts and Voyager training into a university uh, master's course on developing digital collections. Finally, in, in anticipation of the launch of the Pure 3D, Pure 3D infrastructure, like in a year or so, we will develop online training materials that instructs future editors about using the Voyager story framework so that we don't have to do this training in person. Um, and we hope to do this in a way that highlights the concepts of developing rich 3D-centered narratives that equally balance between detailed storytelling and 3D interaction. Thank you. So I only come back for a little bit in, in this presentation. And as, as Kelly was talking, um, when Costas and I first conceived the project, we didn't expect or think about really that training would become such a large, oh, sorry, <laughs> such a large part of it. Um, um, but we realized that it wasn't just how to, training on how to use the tool, but as Kelly was saying, there's, we realized how much conceptual work needs to go into uh, creating a 3D edition, even if you have a background, which hardly anybody has, in creating 
uh, textual scholarly editions, it's so dif different. And even if you've worked with 3D, people don't have the experience in how to annotate around it. So as Kelly said, um, we had some opportunities, but a different opportunity uh, appeared one day um, in the uh, form of Kianori, who emailed me, me, me one day and said, we have some money in uh, Tokyo to bring uh, some people over. And if you remember, this is last summer, and it was virtually impossible to get into Japan um, at that time. As you remember, we should have had this conference last year in Tokyo, which had to be moved online. But I was one of the few people who got into Japan last summer, um, which wasn't easy, and um, did a kind of month-long workshop with some colleagues at uh, Tokyo University. And what was really interesting and exciting about it was that I got to work with a group of academics who some of them had interest in um, uh, traditional scholarly editing, but many did not. But they all had an object and wanted to tell a narrative around it. So we were there for, I was there for about three weeks working very intensively. Um, we had, as you see, quite a number of people and it was another example, nine people, to use our training materials and again, get feedback and have several editions that we didn't anticipate at the beginning created. So what we're going to do, what we'll have now is in fact, both Kinori and John, who both did editions, uh, talk about the ones that they created. Um, so you can see some examples, uh, which will go online as part of our offerings. I don't know who's speaking first. Thank you, Susan. So, so we, villagers living on the outskirts of the village, challenged, challenged to use 3D digital scholarly edition with Voyager, um, helped by Kerry's helpful documentation. So uh, 3D scholarly edition has various interesting and difficult aspects that are not found in the text. Having learned about and discussed then we actually brought each 3D model to create a scholarly edition for each of us per participant. So this is a, so um, here. And this is a group of Buddhist star statues known as the Six Jizo, which as a group have historical significance. There are many of these erected throughout in Japan, and this is one of the most famous. A 3D model of this Jizo group, Six Jizo, was available on open access. So as a Buddhist researcher, I attempt, attempted to use this to create a scholarly edition. So, Two stories about the six Jizo were created using the Voyager functionality. One is a place of six Jizo in the history of Buddhism, and uh, the other is Jizo in Japanese folk beliefs. Well, um, this section is mainly about the creation process. Uh, as Voyager can introduce various web contents. So I've included relevant 3D contents published on Sketchfab as a part of the story. The Jizo is a stone statue and the object, in this case, prayer breeze. It is trying to show is not very accurately represented and is not very clear, unclear. When views when viewed from various angles using the 3D model. However, if we can represent what it is trying to show in this way, including the 3D model, um, the bottom of the the slide. So 
it will be very easy for users to understand the figure of the object. Next, um, Voyager can also import IIIF contents. Here, as the first document of six Jizo, um, then, so Japanese national treasure, classical books are published, um, compared with IIIF. So they are imported as well as the IIIF viewer, universal viewer, like this. Then users can learn about the historical context of six diesels through the wall picture of these variable materials, which are national treasure. So Voyager can also import Google Street View in, in defeating folk briefs. It's also import, uh, important to know where they exist in reality. Here, the object as a folk belief. The Jizo is represented in a form of map and it's fireable photograph of a relatively well-known object. Thank you. Then, yeah, sorry, then students have learned about uh, such things. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jun Nogawa, and I'm also from Tokyo, Japan. And I'm originally the historian on Roman history, so that's why I'm creating this edition, the form of Augustus, which is a very really famous uh, structure in the ancient Rome. So this is the overview of my edition. Actually, I'm, I think I'm not an official project member of Pure 3D, so I, I'm kind of like in the position of just one user. So my presentation is given from that position. Um, so I have two tours. I created two tours about this um, building. The first one is Augustan regime and the form of Augustus. It's kind of like a historical context of the forum because I'm a historian. I'm really interested in what kind of political meaning this building have had for Augustus. So yeah. Uh, there are some articles about uh, the, the general history of the Rom uh, of Roman Republic to the empire, and I put some uh, images or inscriptions or 3D models. Yep, so this is my first tour, and I have a second tour about the reconstruction process of uh, the building. Actually, I and my colleague created the 3D model like that. So this is kind of like a reconstruction that uh, I'm not taking it from like, you know, Sketchfab or something that this is original model that we've created. And we use a lot of uh, sources for this. For example, the reconstructing image or the academic article publications or the, the maps like that or the picture of the ruins. So, my question for the second tour is how we can show the reconstruction process in this uh, tour. So you will see the, the map of the structure with measuring node. It's a red uh, thing, little thing on the map. It's a measuring node. So we measure every single part of the building. So how long, how tall it is, or so, these kind of things. And we created a model. So this is uh, not like a historical context, but this is more like a um, technical uh, process that we've done. Yep. So this is a brief introduction of my edition. And from now on, I have some thoughts uh, through creating these editions. So the first question is who is the audience? This, I think this is a very important point because I'm, uh, yeah. So is that for the public or for scholars? If it's for public, it's more like important to display something uh, and telling the story about that um, 3D models. But 
if it is for scholars, it's maybe it needs to be more analytical or, you know, like simula simulation stuff can be done on the 3D models. And what kind of information should be included, like primary sources or scholarly interpretations? These are kind of like a, uh, information needed for the scholars, but not necessarily for the public, maybe. I, yeah, I'm, so this is a problem, I think. And I found some difficulties in the editing process. So the first one is a physical object and the context. So we have to very focus on the physical object because this is a 3D scholar edition. So the object, like physical object, is very important. But we also have to think about the context of it. It's just not necessarily physical. I mean, so as Kerry mentioned earlier, it's very difficult to take a balance between this physicality and the context thing. And also the second point is uh, multimedia representation of knowledge. So what is the most effective way to transform knowledge uh, about the 3D models? So we're going to use images or sounds or 3D, other 3D models or the videos. So what is the best way to uh, represent the knowledge about the 3D model? And this is kind of like a technical point, I think. But I thought that there, that it is needed to have some ontology, including like 3D models, uh, modeling parameters, or reconstruction evidences like uh, text sources, uh, images, uh, and annotations, articles, interpretation, especially like certainty or the time period information is very important for the historical um, edition. So how are we going to organize all of this uh, information in kind of like a standardized way in such an ontology? So this, of course, I think like um, Pure 3D or Voyager has such an uh, ontology for these kind of things, but there are other, maybe there are other possibilities for organizing this kind of knowledge. So I, I don't, this is kind of like a question for uh, you, like uh, project members. So what do you think about the ontology stuff, so the knowledge organization around the 3D models? And this is my last question or last comments for uh, the pure 3D project or the Voyager, or Voyager itself. So interoperability with other frameworks. Um, I think there are several existing frameworks for 3D knowledge representation. For example, like Extended Matrix or the HBeam or the Archaeological Data Service Data Model or the Scotch. So these are uh, uh, giving a way to organize knowledge around the 3D model. So how Pure 3D project will be collaborated with these kind of existing uh, frameworks or how can be interoperable with those? So this is my yeah, last question and comments about yeah, the project. So this, I, I will skip this and is that you who present this last slide, I think? Thank you very much. So thanks to all the speakers, and now we have uh, 26 minutes for questions and discussion. So who would like to go first? Oh, and I was also asked if the speakers can come here because we're live streaming, so you need to be visible. <laughs> Um, thank you for your excellent presentations. It's um, a very exciting project. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first is regarding uh, the review process. So, uh, you know, um, as scholars who write and publish, we know that uh, to maintain the rigorosity of scholarship, we go through the very intensive kind of 
sometimes blind, double blind review process. And since 3D publication is so new, so I wonder if there's any consideration regarding how this, I don't know, review, peer review process can be brought in into um, you know, the, the development and then the uh, final publication of 3D models. And if, uh, if we consider 3D models as a text, uh, do we also consider previously published um, th similar 3D models as a kind of a literature that we need to give a review of? So does the literature review also come to into play in, t you know, in this editing process? And my second question actually uh, is regard, is, um, is related to the, I don't know, the sustainability or perhaps even the afterlife of uh, 3D publication. Um, because um, I, I think one of the major motives for scholars to publish is in a way to immortalize um, the thoughts at, you know, at least in that particular historical context. So uh, some of the journals published parallelly in text, um, in print form, and also online. So of course for 3D projects, perhaps we only have the online version. So if the materiality of the publication is uh, lacking, then what? how do we deal with this uh, problem of, in a way, still sustaining um, the published um, knowledge or whatever of 3D models? Thank you. So many questions. Uh, whoever wants to um, uh, answer first needs to use the podium. Do you want? Yeah, you can start. Um, so maybe I could take the second two questions. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be really exciting one day to have such a legacy of 3D models that, for example, like in Jun's edition, if there are previous 3D models of the same reconstruction, then you could actually refer to them as we would refer to past uh, uh, published articles. So you could actually look at those, maybe integrate them into your edition to show how your reconstruction differs from previous ones. I'm not quite sure we're there yet. Um, in part, I think because of this problem that w I talked about at the beginning, that most 3D models are used for, in, say, in research for an analysis, and then they're so hard to maintain. Um, the standards change, you don't have room for them, on your servers, you move, the models don't. Um, it's really hard keeping these models and projects alive. Uh, Kelly and I are working on Mount Street that began in 2013. It's gone through several iterations and we think we keep getting all the bits and pieces from the modeler, but we find that the um, lots of the textures are missing when we reconstructed the things come out in funny colors and you know half the textures are there and like we have buildings, half the windows are there, half of them are not. Like he keeps saying he's given, but Kelly spends a lot of time looking for text. So it's not just like a model comes and it it's kind of there. There's so many bits and pieces. So we are working with uh, the national uh, repository in the Netherlands called Dons to also try to figure out how do we keep all of these things and keep it in a way that someone could actually reuse it later. So I'm not sure we have that history that we could do it, but what you're asking or suggesting would be fabulous that you have a, not, not a paper trail, but a 3D model trail that you can use in your reconstruction and show how this differs and why from previous. I, I think that would be fabulous. Um, the third question had to do with, um, let's say longevity. And I've been working in digital scholarly editing as Kianori has for a very long time now. And I have had many uh, colleagues come up to me and say, why should I work on a digital edition or a digital project? Because it, it probably is not going to be there in five years. And I can publish a book or a monograph and it stays part of the scholarly record. So I think this um, question, this reservation goes for a lot of digital scholarship. We can talk about what we think we are going to do. I'll let Costas do that with Pure 3D, but I think one of the things that 
maybe was alluded to a little bit along the way. I mean, we haven't spoken about this, but you know, is it possible, uh, looking at Jamie here, in Pure 3D to get, I mean, this is not ideal, but you know, could you press a button? The answer is no at the moment, but could you press a button and get a kind of static reading, as it were, of the, the addition? So could it be something that you can press and get a, a PDF version that at least the content might be there, if not the version, um, the interactive version? But that discussion, that argument, that reservation, I think exists so much for digital scholarship and becomes part of these very larger infrastructure questions of who maintains this stuff after academics created. If you move institutions, do, does it just get shut down on the server? I, I think these are really big issues that as a community, a very large international community, that it, it just hasn't been really sufficiently addressed. Um, that's not a very good answer. It's not an answer, but it's just, okay, here we are. But I don't know if you want to talk about some of our uh, public um, peer review. Yes, I can uh, quickly do that. I, I will not give you a very concrete answer because that project has not uh, started yet. Um, but uh, so one of the things we're going to do as part of this project is to run uh, focus groups and uh, do some, some qualitative uh, study on uh, how publishers deal with uh, 3D uh, so far, how have they dealt. Uh, in the past, I would say, a decade, there are already some uh, good examples that we can draw from. But then I think the question is, what do you peer review? Uh, because, of course, there is all the content that goes around the 3D Scholar Edition, but then you have the model itself. And does it mean that you need a different reviewer for the model who will evaluate the technical aspects of the model and then a subject expert that will evaluate the contextualization and the narratives around the 3D model? And then you talked about double-blind uh, peer review process, but I think we have already started moving away from from that, the double blind, now we are single blind or openly. And one of the things we, we also discussed, uh, Susan and I, as part of another project we're working on, on open educational resources, is could the reviewer be involved and become a kind of a co-author or get credit along the main author in the process, whereas the person that helps the, the, the main author, editor, conceptualize and work together. So it's a collaborative review process, peer review process, not so much to evaluate at the end. Because also when it comes to 3D and 3D scholarly editions, you cannot have somebody develop the whole edition and then at the very end say, sorry, I'm not going to accept that because there's so much time and effort that has gone into this. So they really need to start much earlier in the review process. So that's my two cents for now. <laughs> uh, thank you for the uh, many good questions. So, and uh, I, I'd like to answer uh, so about uh, digital preservation. So one of the reasons why uh, we joined the Pure 3D project is that so the, this project is included in a kind of a, a context of digital preservation in Euro European and Netherlands um, for academic sections. So in, in Japan, and uh, so in Japan, uh, we didn't have any such kind of uh, digital preservation um, policy for humanities. However, the, um, Pure 3D is included in um, k dance and kunai and uh, such kind of uh, uh, governmental um, po policy. So, and then, so Susan kindly uh, held a um, small meeting with uh, people in kunai. Then we learned about such kind of things. It's also uh, good um, learning for us. Thank you. Hello, um, I'm Jasmine Mulligan from Stanford University Press, and I was happy to see um, constructing the sacred on the screen. Um, 
as for the question of preservation, I was also very interested in this too. Um, I've been working on the production and archiving side of the digital publishing initiative for the press for the last seven years. And I would say, you know, we haven't solved it, but we've definitely like done a lot of work to try and figure out how best to, you know, preserve this type of content. And so I actually was wondering, since um, since Voyager especially is um, browser based, I wondered if you had done any testing um, or playing around with even of web archiving for some of the kind of finished projects that are that are in Voyager. Um, I've had some luck with um, capturing Elaine Sullivan's project, which has the, the interactive 3D environment embedded within Scalar. Um, so it seems like it could be a potential solution for capturing specific interactive projects that are finished. It wouldn't have all of the same code and all of the same assets you know, available for reuse, but it's one way of capturing maybe the interactive um, context, I guess. So. Try. I don't know if this, this will be a direct answer to your question because um, we haven't at the Smithsonian experimented with web archiving uh, much, but I can say that um, with Voyager, uh, we, we did make it a point to separate the, the 3D data from the experience data, as, as I mentioned in my presentation, because at its heart, the experience data is essentially um, text and, and links to things like images. So if you wanted to, you know, you could print that out or make a PDF or something like that for archiving it, but it's also not directly tied to, to technology. So that experiential data, we are confident, you know, it is going to be durable down the road, um, but the 3D model itself, you know, based on history will not probably, at least in the form that it is right now. Um, so in that sense, um, what we do at the Smithsonian, this is a little bit of a departure from Pure 3D, but we, we archive the source data, so we archive the data that the 3D model was created from because we know down the road there will be new technologies and new ways to process that data and create new 3D models. So that's really important to us to, to archive that original data. And then we archive, we archive the derivative models as well, but we um, find it really important to preserve the relationships. So then we know that this derived model came from this data set or even this derived model came from this original model where we made some tweaks or fixes. So in that way, we, um, we archive essentially all the additions of the, the 3D model that was generated, but separate from the experience. So you could, you could have the same experience with a new model. Um, so it's not, it's not a requirement for, for archiving. So apologize, I don't think that directly answered your question, but. So we're, we're also um, struggling with this, and we've had lots of internal conversations about what is, what is it that we would archive, and you know, is it every photograph? We use photogrammetry for the, for the ones that we create ourselves. So is it every one? Is it only the ones that, use them, that were used in the creation of this model? Um, but working with the preservation repository called DOMS, that's what we're in the process of doing now. Also, we are probably going to use um, both a combination of Dublin Core and what they use is Dataverse. So that as well. The other thing that um, Voyager produces is a JSON file that, um, if you want to call it, immortalizes, as it were, all the interactions that happen in Voyager. So it could be possible, but I mean, right now I think this is fantasy, um, to have another viewer one day who could read that file and then recreate all those interactions. So I think right now, no, none of this is possible. It, it, I could say we've done it, so it's not fantasy. Ah, but then you have to have another viewer that reads that. We've done it with another viewer, yeah, just ah. for a proof of concept. We have, um, Google has a viewer called Model Viewer, and so we were able to adapt our, and that JSON file is what I was referring to as our experiential content. Yeah. We were able to adapt that to the model viewer so that we could read that content from an experience created for Voyager and view it and interact with it in Google's viewer. So you just put the, you link to the annotation, they got the store, the articles, 3D model, and it pretty much worked or it really it, worked? It can read all, it really worked. It can read all that content directly from the, the JSON file. Yeah. Ah, so that's even more positive. 
Um, <laughs> not fantasy, that's why Jamie's here. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's possible and you know, the hope is that working with 3D will become, can I use this word, easier? Um, as time goes on, as maybe more of these environments exist, and that they could be interoperable um, in, in ways. Um, so yeah, that um, we've also been following the, what Stanford's been doing, and that maybe it could be someone could create a, um, a, a digital monograph and bring in a, a, something out of pure 3D with, with the viewer. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Beatrice Vajenti from MPFL. I also work on 3D reconstruction, especially of architecture. And I have a, a few curiosities because I think that especially this idea of having the scholarly editions is something that, uh, especially considering the time we put inside of the models, starts being very interesting. And uh, um, since I work with architecture, I wanted to ask you, since I didn't probably get it, uh, with pure 3D, is it possible to also have volumetric annotations? So of doing a sort of segmentation of a part of an object and annotate that, because I had some experience in Sketchfab and I saw they have this point annotations, but sometimes uh, it could be useful, but maybe you do it to have this sort of annotations for architecture. And another one is connected to reusability because you talked about this. And for architecture, I was wondering whether uh, you have ways of sharing also um, CAD uh, 3D files, so B-Rep representations, uh, besides the mesh. I find that for architects it may be useful sometimes to uh, build their models on top of these mathematical representations of reality, while mesh of course is for, for sure useful and fantastic for visualization and 3D printing, but I was wondering if you also uh, had some considerations on this. The okay. first part. Yeah, um, yeah I, I can answer the, the volumetric uh, annotation part. So currently in the version that Pure 3D is using of, of Voyager, we do not have the ability to do that, but we have um, functionality that we've created that we're still testing and are planning to release in the near future. Um, and it's essentially kind of a middle ground. It's not a truly volumetric annotation, but it involves using um, the texture map on the object to represent you know, a volume. So um, in the Voyager story backend interface, you can paint um, a region of the model that you want to annotate, and you can identify a particular color that will outline that region. So it could be a 2D region or it could be a 3D region, and then you can assign an annotation to that. So you can add text or whatever else you want to describe that, that region with. Thank you for questions. Actually, my model that I show you, uh, the, the forum, uh, it was segmented by very small pieces because for just one column or, you know, because that is reconstruction, so we can easily find a way to do that, right? And I'm doing, actually, maybe this is not appropriate to say here, but I'm doing other uh, attempt to represent the knowledge around the 3D model. And in that project, each uh, part of whole building has, um, okay, I, I, I make each part of the 3D building as a linked data, like RDF resource, and then connect the information about that just for that uh, piece of the model. So in that way, we can just put any information for very small part of the whole building or something. So maybe it's useful for your yeah. uh, purpose. I, I'm not sure though, yeah. No, thanks, thanks for the answer, uh, totally. And I think uh, going towards also the possibility of having this in a web viewer is certainly something very useful because I find it that sometimes not having this way of painting, of having a sort of visual, uh, let's say segmentation at least of what we annotate can be for some specific objects because of course every one of us is working with very specific case studies. It can be sometimes confusing, but I think that having already this uh, is a very big step forward, so thanks. for AutoCAD. So we did a small experiment with uh, the new institute in the Netherlands, which is the Architecture Archives in the Netherlands. Uh, they're not formally partners, uh, 
but they had a model that uh, they developed 20 years ago as part of an expo. And what they wanted to explore was a CAD model. And what they wanted to explore is actually how they can use it within uh, Forager. It was a three, 3D CAD. Uh, it was not two dimensional, but they went through and they have applied for a small funding. Maybe they will get it to explore it more, but they went through um, the thinking process and the methodology of how you go from a CAD model with potentially missing uh, files, eh, all the connections that you have in, in, in CAD files. How do you integrate those into Voyager and how do you uh, write a narrative around those? So we have done a small experiment so far. So are there any plans to have a creator also edit something? So if, for example, there's a reconstruction, there's continuous research, but there's also already a edition that was made. Can you edit that? And is it then visible what the edit was? Yes, if, if I understand the question, yes, the idea is so uh, of course, you you develop the you you make an account and you start developing the edition. When it's ready, you can you can publish it. But then uh, there is a versioning, so you can go back to your original one and create a new version with changes in the annotations or maybe add a, a, another part of the model as well. We have uh, done that. Oh, you mean somebody else or the main? No, I think the first the, the same person. So if there's like something yeah. new was, was reconstructed or there's something changed for, I don't know, like yeah, yeah. Uh, that you can also see it. So it's, it's also visualized in the model what the changes was. Uh, Maybe. Uh, you would say yes, yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or you can just duplicate your edition. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I forget what I just said. So I, I completely just blank on what I so, said. So it's either so that the editor it's herself or himself has to make it visible in the edition. Or yeah, yeah. So yeah, thank, thank you. So yeah, either you as the editor will um, go back, maybe, yeah. So I think you could duplicate your edition, uh, make the changes, and then what would be, so your original edition doesn't necessarily have to disappear. It could be there as like version one, and then version two can refer back to that one and says, oh, um, initially I thought it was this, you can see it back here, but now I've made these changes. Or you can using the Voyager um, like tools, because again, it's really flexible and you can do a lot. Like I'm always discovering new ways to represent information with the tool set that, are, that exists. Um, you could have hypothesis one as like one model and then within your tour show your hypothesis two or like new information was discovered this is my updated version of that model um, so I think I imagine an editor could do that in two different ways so it's like versioning is kind of with so, to, so you can do versioning with the editor yeah and, and as Kelly was saying there's a couple of ways to do versioning so you could leave the whole thing as it is and refer back, or as Kelly was saying, within the, the model, have just one version and show by various means what your previous uh, understanding was and notes around that and then why and how you've changed it. But so there's no standard, it's just the editor can choose what yeah, I think like, that, like in very traditional editions, there isn't a standard way of doing anything. And of course, there are so many, you can just see from what we presented today, and even the questions that were asked, there are so many mo kinds of models with so many, I will say, authorial intentions that there isn't, I think if we were to say you must do it this way, we would A, be limiting, because what we found in the process of, uh, is people really using, and that's I think what Jamie was saying as well, really using the tool is so many different ways. So right now I think we would not come down on a way to do it. The other thing that maybe you were alluding to is can anyone come? And right now the answer is no. Um, 
it could, and, and that's also to preserve the authorial intention. We don't, and, and, it, and it does create a much more complex administrative inter infrastructure that you would have to allow people in and where they could make, so there's not a way, an easy way to just make comments along the side because so much of it is embedded within the, the viewing experience. We've discussed it, but right now, given our, um, where we are in development, that it's more important to have the addition and it could be an editorial team, um, but just a random person can't come and um, make changes at this point. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, uh, it's time. It's 12.30 uh, and it's time for lunch. Thank you very much to, well, to uh, the speakers. Thank you very much for all the attendees for contributing to the conversation. Uh, just remember if you know anyone with uh, 3D or you're interested, we have the call for new projects. So please uh, spread the word. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you.